Well, I've got Jeff Lutz here today. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. And I know that there's so many things going on right now that uh, that uh, people are interested in having lots of conversations about. It's almost on X, it's almost starting to like drown out uh, the conversation about, uh, about uh, Tesla. But I did think there was a very interesting analysis by AJ this morning. Did you have a chance to see that? Uh, he sends a lot of good stuff out, so I, I, I usually a, read sorry, it every this day. Was, this was the analysis of uh, his stock estimate for Tesla going forward. Uh, no, I did not. Oh, Let's okay. Yeah. He, bas he basically projected that we would, between en just energy, FSD, and the cars, he was projecting that profits would double next year from where they are now, and therefore the stock should double next year. By August of next year, and I and I, you know, that's that's a rough analysis. He didn't include Robotax in that. He did not include Optimus in that. Um, we, we, I know you haven't seen it, but just off the top of your head, uh, that looks almost like one of the, you know one of Randy's uh, <laughs> optimistic statements. And I certainly don't disagree with him. What do you think about that? Just off the top of your head. Well, I have to look at it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do, I do look at. AJ's posts and I do, I like them. I like a lot of them. I share a lot of them. I think he does a lot of good work. Uh, I just have to figure out how we get from where we are today to to that because I know at best by the end of next year, Tesla's saying on the auto side that you know they're they're driving for fifty percent more production. Right. So um, so I can definitely see a big move up there, but I wouldn't see a doubling out of auto. Now energy could move up pretty, you know meaningfully higher, especially with Shanghai coming online. Right. Right. Uh, but, you know, if Shanghai comes online in, in quarter one, it's nowhere near its full capacity, not even in quarter two. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, that should get the full rate by the end of the year. And then, so yeah, if you're thinking about it from a run rate perspective, like where will they be in week 52 uh -huh. of next year versus week 50, you know, versus where we are today? Um I can see it. If you're talking August to August, I'd have to do some more math um, on it to to see where where we get to. But I think you know what? A lot of these things are spooling up for Tesla. I think to his point, whether it's FSD and the revenues that should start coming off of that versus the prior couple of years should be significant, especially as FSD goes global. Um, and and then we talked about auto energy. So I mean, a lot of things are starting to spool up in their favor for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think if I remember right, he was thinking. I think it was based on a dollar thirty-four uh, per quarter. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of profit by the by the third uh, quarter. So that's profitability. Cool. Yeah, that would be in double. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that was that was kind of his theory. Um, uh, then of course there's Robotaxi and Optimus, and so we've been for the last few days. I've just been asking everybody. What do you think is the thing? What you know, the Nvidia moment? How you know, Optimus is probably more towards the end of the year, or maybe even into twenty six before we get that Nvidia moment. But RoboTaxi could be next week. It could be the end of the. It could be the end of the year. It could be the first quarter. Do you have a a vision in your head of the kind of thing that the street and the retail investors will have to see? Uh, before we, you know, get that, you know, 50% jump in a few, few days or a week. You know, I think it is going to be a little bit more difficult uh, for it to sneak up upon Tesla because of just how widely it's discussed. I mean, these, you know, the, these, if you look at some of these YouTube accounts and some of the videos, I mean, if you add them up, you know, some of these add up to greater than, you know, finan FinTech TV, in terms of the, so there's a lot, there's a lot of interest yeah. in talking about Tesla and you do a great job of asking the right questions and bringing out the right data. And there's others that do this as well. So it's going to be pretty widely discussed. It's also very widely discussed on X. I'm not saying that even with all that in mind, that it can't, there are some things that can sneak up. For example, an FSD license agreement, right. an FSD expansion globally. But even that, I think the media is going to have a difficult time understanding what that license agreement means to Tesla. What it means is, that, 
if you start doing the sum of the parts on the business, Tesla is creating bigger businesses inside of Tesla that on their own could be large, very stand up, very large businesses. Charging is, is going in that direction. I think FSD is going to go in that direction. And, but I think the media is going to struggle with it until they see, they start seeing the earnings print. Now back to AJ's point, if they could start, you know, literally doubling EPS, uh, you, you know, that's going to, that's going to get some attention. And the question is going to be is where's the macro economy? What is the macro, where's the macro economy? What are they going to be paying for tech stocks at that point? Right. Uh, and by the way, I'm not a, a strict PE person, but there is some relative, you know, like where's the, re where's the rest of macro ad and what are they paying? Uh, but I don't think Tesla is a stock that you necessarily just do the PE calculation and place your bets. You really have to look at where the company's innovating and where these milestones are going to hatch. And that goes back to your original question. So, you know, I think when, when, I think Waymo is even showing right now that you can have a fairly significant in terms of magnitude and revenue. We don't know profitability yet, but if you're giving out a hundred thousand rides a week, that's a big number. And it shows you that this robo taxi market is pretty big. Yeah. And, and when, when Tesla turns on, I do think they'll, they'll turn on in, in small batches, but it will be something that could be turned on globally. Uh, and at least turn on, you know, nationally, you know, as they get regulatory approval, I don't think they have to, you know, do small cities and wait and dwell for months and months. So I think robo taxi could be a moment. I think you're more than a year away from Optimus. I don't think people are going to be getting too far ahead of Optimus yet because they don't get it because it's never been done before. And it's going to be difficult for people to understand from people like me or people like you that have walked the lines in factories and understand the industrial application here, we know it's fairly significant. So I, I think, I think the moments that can be somewhat of a surprise are the licensing moments and the expansion moments, but these bigger things, I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of discussion on X. I think Tesla versus an NVIDIA or even an Apple is, is the more widely discussed name out there on the internet that I think than anything. Yeah. So one, th one thought would be Brian White the other day said he thinks we can get to 2 million vehicles this year. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised either because I think the FSD is going to start to draw more sales. And then you've got, of course, the cyber truck. And um, so he thinks we still have a shot at 2 million. China's doing well and the factory there is spitting them out pretty well. Uh, if we got to 2 million, then a 50% increase next year, we 3 million instead of 2.7 million. So that, yeah, would they, another, that would add a 300,000 cars. Yeah, they, they gave the 50% guidance off of 2023. Uh, and I don't think anybody uh, anybody can, anal anybody that I know that analyzes production better than Brian. So I, 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 but, but this is more of a sales proclamation of doing, if you're, if you're doing the, you know, two million, closer to 2 million units, you're really talking about sales. So, yeah. but they're totally, they're tightly correlated. Uh, I do trust Brian on production. I'd be interested to see where he's at right now. But yeah, I mean, it looks like there's some momentum, but it also looks like there's definitely something going on from an auto macro perspective, because I, I published some numbers earlier this week. And if you look at June, 2024 versus June, 2023, just those months, mm -hmm. and you look at registrations, registrations are not sales. Registrations are moving from the dealer network to a consumer purchasing it. The way the auto industry counts sales is going from the factory into yeah. the wholesale right. dealer network. So this is actually a truer representation of where the consumer is at. And the total total U.S. auto is down 9%. In EV June. only. In yeah, June. total. Yes. And if you compare June of 2024 versus June of 2023, it's down 9%. Uh, and during that time frame, a million cars have been added into inventory from June of 2023 to June of 2024. That million cars represents that we have a doubling in terms of the average inventory in days. It's a, it's at a hundred and it's, and it's about double where the automakers want to be. So you have rising inventories, but then when you look at registrations, it's 9% lower for the overall auto industry. EVs up 3%. 
Tesla's actually down June to June about 2% mm -hmm. uh, in that time period. But it looks like they're building up some pretty good momentum now um, with this financing deal. And it looks like, uh, I think things are no much, but it looks like they, they're, they're, they're having some really good numbers coming out lately. So with all that said, when, when he's asking about, can we get the 2 million units? I mean, what's going on with the consumer? Credits are tightening, credit spreads are tightening, credit availability is at a four month consecutive low. It's making new lows in terms of auto credit availability. Loan rejection rates are at an, an all time high. They've only been counting this, I think, just after the great financial crisis, auto loan re rejections. So the New York Fed does that. So you have some factors here building up that would say, you know, danger Will Robinson. Uh, but I, I've always believed that in a macro auto slowdown, a pure EV player that is building vehicles profitably and has figured out how to bring cost parity to where ICE is today and eventually lower, they're going to, they're going to be hit and there's going to be issues, but they're going to come out of it faster. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I think it's hard to say. I think you have some macro auto variables here that make it a little, a little scary. Uh, so we'll have to see, and you have to, you have to look at the election too. And what are those dynamics? There's a lot of conversation, you know, Trump's elected, he's going to get rid of the $7,500 credit. He can't do that, you know, from the executive office. It is a law that's passed by Congress. Right. I think it's important for your listeners to know that. And his treasury changed the list of vehicles that are approved. Yes. But can they actually go back and undo the impetus of the bill, which is $7,500 credit to consumers for the, for buying these particular vehicle types and then the battery credit to the, for battery manufacturing? No, that would have to be a law that would have to go through to actually change that. Do, uh, when, when do you get the July numbers, the July registration numbers uh, on the vehicles? I would think in a couple of weeks that we would get that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking a couple of weeks. I mean, the June numbers were just released in the last week. Okay, all right. So, all right. So then um, we basically maybe changing the subject then a little bit then since you've brought up the whole business of the auto business going in the toilet in June, if you will. Yeah. Um, I've been saying for a week now, maybe maybe we talked about this last Wednesday, I don't remember. That was, for me, that was the last shoe. I mean, housing's already in, already horrible and it went down really big in July. Um, nine, also nine or more percent, 8%, 9%, something on that order. Small business, NFIB, they're screaming. Consumers are saying they're in trouble. Um, you just go, to, you know, manufacturing is in trouble. Uh, trucking is in trouble, has been for two years. So it was kind of, to me, auto was like, oh my goodness, one more shoe has dropped. Are we already in a recession? Yeah, I think you're going to get recessions in pockets of areas. I, I So first off, there's one thing to say on auto. There was a, a, a software outage in June that right. did affect the dealer's abilities to close transactions. Right. Some had workarounds but it, there was some impact. But when I looked at the July inventory data, which was released, mm -hmm. it, it's not like we moved from 116 days back down to 80. We're still over a hundred days of inventory okay. and we've been steadily increasing the entire year. So we may have gotten a little bit of spike with the software outages for the, um, for the okay. dealer networks, but I didn't see it snap back. Uh, into a V-shaped recovery. Let's see how August looks. But I, to answer your question, I think you know we're going to see pockets of recessions. I think you're you know you've seen it for for what it's done to housing, and I, I do think you're going to have an auto slowdown. You've got automakers, by the way, some are in really bad shape. You have Stellantis; they're they're over 150 to 200 days of inventory. You've got executives leaving left and right. And you've got a UAW that literally has put a gun to their head and say, you will open this new factory in Belvedere, Illinois. And it's like, well, you're Stellantis. No sane business would say I've got a hundred, right. I've gone from my target of 50 days. I've got 200 days of inventory. Let me open another factory. That's right. the answer. Yeah. So the, the, you have some nonlinear things happening here. And I do think that, you know, that's going to come to a head. If I were Stellantis, I would not open factory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. That's understandable. Um, so related, we so we got the Fed, 
you know, going to make a decision in three weeks. I mean, it's still three weeks away before yeah. the meet. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to have uh, P- PCE. We're going to have all kinds of job reports. Jackson Hole. We're going to have Jackson Hole. We're going to have a CPI. We're going to have, you know, CPI is actually the first day of the meeting is the CPI. So there's an awful lot of stuff coming between now and then. So I'm going to talk a little bit out of both sides of my mouth. I'm going to say, I think we're in recession. I think we're overall actually negative GDP at this point. And I think there's just too many evidences of it. In fact, I was just reading an article before we came on and this uh, this guy was a, an economist. And of course, you know, if you get five economists in a room, you get six opinions. But this, <laughs> this guy says, um, the bond market is saying that we're already in recession. The gold market is saying we're in recession. Commodities yeah. are saying we're already in recession. And the equities equity market is saying that we're you know we're going to the moon that the, nothing could be uh, so it's kind of like this two worlds that are the same uh, folks sort of making some bets and the bets are on going to different directions. So with that in mind, I'm on the one hand saying I think that we're technically already under you know, at a negative GDP right now. And yet on the other, out of the other side of my mouth, I'm going to say the jobs numbers may still not be enough to move the Fed and that the CPI might come in still around 3%, 2.9, 2.8 year over year. And they might go, you know what? Never mind. We can't do it yet. What do you think? Well, you also have to question the credibility of the government data. So this morning it was announced- that you know, eight hundred eighteen thousand jobs were not really added over, I think, a eleven or twelve month period, and, and the- that basically, yeah, that basically subtracted about thirty percent of their advertised job gains over the last year. Now, if you net all that out, you and, and people look at this two different ways depending on what kind of outcome you want to have. Yeah. If you were to average it out, yes, we're still aver- adding an average 160 or 170,000 jobs a month. That is not recessionary. Right. The problem is, is that's not how things actually happened. And you can't even believe any of this data because the, the Q3 and Q4 last year, I mean, there was actually a negative jobs print. We would have been freaking out if we had literally a net negative jobs uh, for Q3 of last year. And that's actually what happened according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, Statistics now that they've re- recasted these numbers. So it's hard to like, what do you believe the, uh, the GDP numbers get recasted continuously? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't even know what to believe. I and mean, we did have two consecutive quarters of negative GDP in 2022. And you don't even hear people talking about that right. as being recessionary, but, but you know, technically it, it, was. it was. So Right now, we're act- I think we're monkeying around with the definition of a recession. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there, there's like way too much consensus needed on what this is. And it should be a lot more objective uh, than what it is. But I think we're going to have these rolling pockets of recession. I don't know. the auto- I'm concerned about the auto industry because they don't move quickly. They have very long supply networks, very long um, channel networks, and... I don't know how they get out of this. Uh, I Let's see if we get a much better number for August and they start taking inventory down. Great. But I'm worried a lot of that GDP in Q2 was all this auto, a lot of this auto inventory. They were just building up in the inventory. And there's a great article today on Stellantis. And, and the question was, and this is in Tesla was actually posed with a similar question, different magnitude. Why did you build all those cars in Q2 if you had all that inventory? So somebody was definitely pushing a gross margin figure. Somebody was definitely pushing a revenue number. Somebody was trying to definitely push numbers out. And, you know, the inventories were or have been built. They're, they're the worst in the industry. Right. And Tesla had a similar, uh, not similar, but they, they were posed with a similar challenge of they had that supply stranded inventory from Q1, from the Red mm-hmm. Sea issue, the Model 3 ramp issue. And Tesla chose to get the channel inventory down, build less, Take the gross margin hit. Why are you taking a gross margin hit? You're building less units. Your fixed costs have a fewer number of units to divide into, and therefore your cogs are higher. So they took that hit on gross margins. I believe they made the right move in a slowing you know, macro auto industry. Stellantis didn't, and that's where we are where we are. But I think the answer to your question, the auto industry is definitely flipping into a recession territory, in my opinion. So here's a weird question, and maybe I'm asking you, and may not be a, a place where you, well, you know, maybe you do have some specific knowledge in this area. 
I can remember 20, 30 years ago when I was way more actively involved in Europe and China that we paid a lot of attention to how those countries were doing in terms of how it impacted uh, US, the US economy, uh, whether that was in terms of our exports or even our service exports, uh, whether that was in terms of uh, what we might end up paying for products out of those places. Um, right now, uh, Europe seems to be not doing well at all. Japan is doing horrible. China now seems to be maybe trying trying to get out of it, but they don't seem to be able to figure out how. I, I don't hear as much conversation about how the rest of the world potentially being in rough shape is impacting our own economy. Yeah, you don't. We're we're in an election year, so what what we're doing now is we're comparing ourselves to them, and you know, there's a term for that, and it, it's it's um it's not a, it's not a good thing. We should be comparing ourselves to you know what we believe best in class is, what's best for our economy, and not that we think we we have you know quote unquote best uh, you know best recovery. You have to just look at the absolute numbers and and figure out how we're doing. I, it, the bond market, the gold market, these things are all screaming like, you know, recession time. But, you know, there there are, you know, if you look at our absolute, I would love for them to restate, by the way, our absolute unemployment, what's our actual unemployment level, what that is. But if you look at what they were, at least previously stated, it's not recessionary. The problem is, is the move up that we've had in a year that is what's concerning. I think that's what's concerning the bond markets too, is this sharp rise or over the Fed mandate in terms of what they were where they would like to see the jobs market at. So they better cut. And the question is, is it 25 or 50 in in September? But they they really need to send the, start sending the right messages to the markets and they really need to make capital more available. Again, we're seeing that people can't get loans. By the way, the average auto loan for a used car is 14%. Who the hell wants to get a, a used car, you know, for that's the average, you know, it's average credit score, average. Yeah. It's 14% and it's eight or 9% for a new car. Who the hell wants to enter into, um, you know, a six, seven, eight year term for that? Nobody wants to. So it, they're going to kill the market until they can get the rates down. So M2 is also down, um, and that apparently is a 100% marker um, for recession, that all four times since the turn of the last century, yeah. not this one, but the previous one, uh, all four times that M2 has been down, uh, it has uh, presaged a, a coming recession. Um, but we also saw M2 go way up because of the uh, pandemic. Do you think this is pandemic related, or do you think that we should be really paying attention when M2 goes down. Well, I think you have to look at is M2, you have to look at it on a percentage and an absolute basis. And then you have to look at it relative to GDP. I think those are the smart ways to look at it. M2 should be coming down from a percent perspective based on what we were spending mm -hmm. during COVID. So the, 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 the absolute direction had to be down. The question is where is money supply relative to the size of our economy? And uh, th that may be a better thing to go look at. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, let's turn a little bit to something related to politics, but we'll try to keep it economic. Um, are you surprised to see the Harris momentum stop in its tracks basically this week? Um, now that they're in convention, um, all the momentum was up, and now the betting markets have all turned 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 back to Trump, um, except for one. There's uh, I forget investor. I can't remember which one is called, but anyway, one of the one of the betting markets is still showing Harris ahead. But overall, it's now tied between if you even if you take that outlier into account, it's tied. Um, and uh, the um, uh, what do you call it? The regular polling is also starting to turn back towards Trump. Are you shocked by that? Surprised by that? What do you think? Yeah, I think is the I mean, first off, there's no economic policies for that um, party on, you know, that, on that website. And as they, have you know, last Friday was, you know, we've started hearing the first policies actually coming from the candidate's mouth around, you know, price controls. And then they've had to go back and do 
some cleanup on that. But then there's been the, uh, you know, are you adopting the Biden tax proposal? And that's what led to a lot of the activity yesterday of, you know, are we taxing unrealized gains? Are we raising capital gains to 45%? You know, are we doing wealth tax? Are we doing all these things? And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, especially in, in blue states, especially if you're, if you're dealing with money, who thought it was a great idea and were feeling good and feeling joy, may all see like the, the stone cold reality of like, if these policies are real and if this momentum can, you know, if this, I guess, pre convention momentum were to continue or it starts actually sweeping up congressional. And I think the Senate is in a really tough position for Democrats to win. I just look at the contest. I look at who's up for reelection and, 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 you know, they lost Joe Manchin, which was basically, it's a, that's a slam dunk that that's going Republican next time. And so I think the Senate is in a tough position for them. So I think if we have split government, I think that's actually the best thing for the market. But I mean, if, if there is some chance, if there is some groundswell of momentum and it does sweep up and you get all the government going, you know, you can have some pretty dangerous monetary policy and economic policies, you know, coming down. And I think it would, it would be really adverse for markets. I'm never one to like, you know, be like, it would be, you know, the end of whatever kind of doomsayer, but you know, a lot of people just have very short term memories or somebody that posted about, you know, look where we are. We have the markets are at all time high, but I think you have to remember the markets drew down 25 to the 40% in the first couple of years of the, of the current administration. And that wiped out a lot of people. So, um, I think the betting markets, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to try to get ahead of polling and they're kind of going to, you're going to see those move a little bit faster than polling. A lot of the polling, you got to ask the question, like what's the sampling in the polling, any poll you look at, you could have some that are shaded towards the R's. Some, a lot of them have been shaded towards oversampling Democrats. You really just have to look at my advice on polls is just don't overreact to any poll until you see the sampling data. Even the same poll from the same company, they'll oversample on one versus, you know, a repeat poll they'll do two or three weeks later, they'll oversample. So my advice is always to look at and, and try to get a hold of that sampling data. So I'm not surprised to see the shift that economic policies are, are, are a real problem. And the fact that the candidate has not spoken you know, in a constructive interview or press conference, I would think it would have to start concerning people, at least some people, maybe not all people. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier today, well, starting last night, but becoming a, a more of a groundswell today, um, RFK Jr. Uh, uh, hinting pretty broadly that uh, there will be a meeting in Phoenix on uh, Friday. Uh, Trump is going to be in Phoenix on Friday. He's going to be in Phoenix on Friday. So there's an awful lot of conversation that RFK Jr. is going to bow out and that maybe he's already been offered a cabinet post. And you say? I say he's got tremendous leverage. He's got a percentage of voters that support him. Um, and he's got leverage in this conversation. And he's been he's been on the record in terms of the Harris campaign of not getting behind that. But, you know, I think this could flip and go a couple of different ways. So we'll see. Uh, but he, he certainly has leverage if those votes and those people that, you know, when you endorse someone, it's not like you can actually physically move, yeah. you know, the votes over. Uh, this isn't, the, you know, this isn't the other party, but um, it, you know, an endorsement, uh, it, it would be meaningful and would be helpful, but especially in a close race like this. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, I know that uh, you and I are not going to impact uh, any decisions that are going to be made over at Trump headquarters. But uh, if you start lining up your cabinet and you've got Trump, v Vivek, and uh, RFK, um, all of a sudden you're you're looking at uh, just those three, uh, and then maybe you add in Tulsi Gabbard. Um, you can start to be, you know, showing some <clears throat> pretty good strength of in terms of the of the wellspring of talent that uh, that might be available. And then if you have Elon advising um, in terms of, you know, government efficiency, that could be interesting as did well. You, see, you, see the name yeah. of the, did you see the name of his committee? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it, it, it could be highly disruptive. I think you're going to, by the way, remember the installed 
you know, base of people that are in these hundreds of thousands and millions of jobs, if they do get disrupted like this, you're going to hear a lot of noise. You're going to hear a lot of rumors. You're going to hear a lot of things. I think you're just going to have to drown out the noise. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves, but if they were to be put in those positions, I think they would be highly disruptive. They also, some of these have to get Senate approval. So it's going to be interesting to see how, you know, can they, can they flip some of these things and, and, uh, and get through, you know, the installed, the, the establishment, right? Yeah. Establishments, both sides. Of course. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah. So um, coming back to Tesla for a moment, we would be remiss if we didn't ask you for your weekly uh, report on your FSD experience. Uh, still, uh, still uh, excited. I am. I, I got, uh, I got 12.5.1.3 yesterday. I've been on 5.1.1 for some okay. period of time, Okay. maybe just a couple of weeks. And so I've just done a couple of drives and I'm starting to see a little bit of a difference, how it accelerates out of turns. Um, so we're, it, it just to me, it, it looks like more progress. Uh, I, I have had a couple of times where I would need to intervene in a construction area. Uh -huh. um, I've had two two just completely different thing, uh, responses in the same situation. This was basically single lane highway. There's a uh, construction cones coming up. You know, they're doing tree trimming on my side. So I'm gonna have to go around into the other lane. So there's somebody manually holding a slow and a stop sign. And he flips it to stop and my car stopped. I'm like, this is beautiful. And the first time this happened, he flipped it to stop. My car stopped 10, 15 feet in front of me. He flipped it to slow. My car, it was almost like it just started swerving around and going around and just started, started to proceed. I'm like, this is perfect. This is great. And I have a video of that too. <laughs> Same situation the other day. Um, he's, he's holding the stop sign. He's moving in a little bit. And at some point, you know, we would stop, we've been stopped for a good period of time. So I don't know if the car's like, Hey, wait a minute, maybe I've been at the stop sign too long and I can look, I don't see any other cars coming. It's time for me to go. So then it proceeded. So. I think in these exception situations, there's still there's still definitely some work to do. There's obviously features they still have to integrate with reverse and mm -hmm. summon and so forth. So I mean, these are there's must haves that need to happen, but I could definitely see it progressing. And this is before you know the Texas cluster comes online. This is before all this stuff. So I'm I'm pretty excited. I do think the team you know they have a lot of permutations to deal with with hardware three, hardware four, and there's multiple permutations I believe inside of that that they've got to deal with. So I still think they're working through that and they've got to get Cybertruck up and going. It looks like they announced today they'll do it in like a two part one is just get the parking sensors up and going and then get FSD going. Uh, but it looks like they're expecting that for September. So all I'll say is like, these things are difficult to, when you're, when you're doing something that's never been done before, right? <laughs> I do see in the communities like, Hey, you said it'd be 10 days or it'd be 12 days. And just, I calm down a bit. I think it's it, it's in Elon's nature to put an aggressive date out to drive his teams. Mm -hmm. And I think their teams are self-motivated. Uh, but when you're doing something that's never been done before, and then the, the price of doing something wrong is somebody getting seriously injured or killed, they're going to err on the side of, of being safe. So these things are going to be difficult to predict. All right. I'm going to get your opinion on this because I'm getting uh... – uh, 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 different opi different opinions for different people. Do you think that when FSD, I'm sorry, when Robotaxi is released officially out there, ready to go, um, and will there will there be a a, a I, I we need a name for this person? Will there be a a person who can intervene if the car says there's a problem, not if the person says there's a problem? Not if the the passenger, but if the individual in the car, I mean, if the car itself recognizes that it's going to, it's a, in, in some kind of a problem, will there be somebody that will be able to intervene like they have with Waymo and these other things? Yeah. You know, that's a very, that's a very tricky thing because as soon as you give remote access to something like that, you're going to have to have somebody that's kind of certified and trained to deal with these situations and like what you, cause I can imagine like they're, they're going to give this app 
to Tesla owners to like, can you add your car to the network? But if your car is in a sticky situation, I don't think that everybody that has been given that app is necessarily the right person to make a decision about how to control that car remotely. So I think the way Tesla is going to approach it is they're going to be they're going to be very careful. And I think that they would delay the rollout of RoboTaxi until you get to the point where those situations are, you know, or call it, you know, one in a million, one in 10 million opportunity in terms of happening. But that's just my speculation. I mean, the other, the other thing that they could do is, yeah, have some sort of central area to deal with these situations, but it'd have to be highly trained personnel. Um, so we'll, we'll see how it, when you, when you have AI, you have the ability to do this local reasoning at some point that intelligence is going in that, in that decision-making and that judgment will, will far exceed the ability of humans. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's what Tesla is banking on. Remember these vehicles that are being teleoperated today from these other companies don't have the perception capability and don't have what, what Tesla has in these vehicles and definitely what they'll have with AI five. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't have that capability. So I think what Tesla is banking on is artificial general intelligence to, if you get stuck in that situation, that it will make the safest maneuver out. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So anything else on your list of uh, things that you're excited about right now, before I start going over the numbers where I know you'd, you'd like to, you'd prefer to, uh, to say ta-ta before we go there. No, I think we covered a lot. I think it was a good conversation, Randy. I, I, I'm looking forward to 1010. I'm looking forward to, you know, these interim delivery numbers. I think they've had a strong quarter and, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to also some, you know, some major milestones occurring, whether it's a license agreement, whether it's FSD expansion. I think we're, we're on the uh, precipice of one of these things happening soon. All right. Okay. Thanks as always for jumping on. We'll see you next week. Thanks, Randy. All right. Bye for now. Take care. Bye. All right. Well, let's take a look at uh, what is happening with the numbers right now. And let's uh, we'll start, as always, with Tesla in the after hours and in the after hours up 11 cents. So that is probably not going to change your life very much up two dollars and 17 cents for the day. So that was a good number finishing at two twenty three twenty seven. Now, I of course, I've always believed that it was $220, which was the technical number we needed to get across. Brian uh, White, I think it was the other day, or was it Brian Wong? I can't remember. One of them said, no, the real number is 224. So we'll see if maybe tomorrow we can bridge, we can go across that bridge as well. And then we'll know for sure that we've uh, solved the technical issue and could be on our way to 270. Um, all right, the rest of the market, we had the Dow up 55 today, the NASDAQ up 102, S&P up 23 in percentages. That was 14%, I'm sorry, 0.14% for Dow, uh, 0.57 nicely for the NASDAQ and 0.42 for the S&P. The rest of the MAG7 was mixed, about as mixed as you can get. NVIDIA was up a full percent today, starting to maybe... Um, maybe people are starting to think maybe they should be. I forgot to ask. I was one of the things I wanted to talk to uh, to uh, to let lots about. But anyway, um, let's uh, go ahead then. And I think Kathy Woods also mixed with a couple down, but most of the rest up today. Um, all right, let's go ahead and look at where things are now, though. And we'll start and see. Lately, the bonds are coming in later. They don't come. They don't start showing the bonds until 4:30 my time. It appears. So I'm getting yeah. I'm getting the whole thing still grayed out on my on my uh, computer. Um, so, but let's go ahead and take a look at oil, which dropped more today after I said it couldn't. Well, we got oil, believe it or not, at 72 for Texas Intermediate, down a couple today. Brent sitting at 76, a $4 difference. That's interesting in itself, up a, do a dollar more than the normal $3 difference and where it has been for quite a while now. And then we've got natural gas, which is, of course, as you know, just been uh, all over the place, but up 0.73 in the pre-market right now. Gold today up uh, another 370 in the uh, pre-market 
Um, I don't think that's an all-time high, but it's in the ballpark of an all-time high. It's it's right in that area. Silver still trying to break through 30, 2966, up 0.42, and copper up 0.32, um, sitting at 420. So copper having a little recovery here after after Jeff and I just discussed how copper was down, down, down. Well, it is down from the five point something, 5.1, 5 5.2 that it was just a little while ago. The dollar down against the yen, uh, 0.24 up against the euro, but barely at 0.06%. And Bitcoin has um, rebounded today back over 60, but not by much, 61,159. And that probably has to do with the fact that the Harris campaign today put out a statement on cryptocurrencies, which was a favorable statement. So therefore we might begin to see uh, some movement of Bitcoin back into more positive space, but I'm not, I'm not, that's not a prediction, not even close. <laughs> I'm just saying that was good news for Bitcoin. As you know, I take no position on my $10 investment there. All right. Dow Jones uh, up 55 or 0.14 in the pre-market. S&P up 0.42 or 23.73. NASDAQ actually unch in the pre i'm sorry this is incorrect i looked at the wrong place would you uh, excuse me <laughs> it's pretty funny because the dow is the one that's actually unchanged the s p is up 0.03 so a dollar i mean at 1.50 and then as that barely you know also 19.5 or 0.1 so very very little movement we continue to have this stagnant flat 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 week that is how I predicted it at the beginning of the week. And I said that I thought Tesla would be moving up slowly um, as we get closer and closer to 1010. That has been taking place. I think that we will continue to see that. And I think I agree with Nick last night that whatever happened today with the Fed and their statement where they were talking about, uh, you know, yeah, probably going to happen. We're probably going to get that, you know, 25% uh, uh, drop. Um, probably baked in already, uh, whatever the, is said on Friday, unless it's really different. If it continues to confirm the 0.25 in any way, shape or form, it doesn't take away from it. I don't think it's going to move markets. I think we're going to be into next week. Now, there is a couple of uh, PMIs coming out tomorrow that could be surprising. Sometimes the PMIs do move the market. So we'll see what happens with those. Other than that, um, I continue to see uh, Tesla going to 265 before 1010. And then after 1010, if everything is good, if we're getting the kind of stuff we need, like feature complete and like uh, uh, level four, level five, sometime later in the year, first of next year, then we go to all time highs. And then eventually with RoboTaxi 700, that continues to be my plan. That's, that's, that's the best I can give you right now. AJ has given his plan, which does not include RoboTaxi, although I'm sure he has a plan, including, I should ask him, um, going to uh, past all-time highs in August of next year, even without RoboTaxi. That's interesting. And maybe that might impact how you're thinking about how you play the stock right now. Although maybe you have to wait till after the run-up on NVIDIA next week. Did I say that out loud? Well, that's what AJ thinks. I don't know why we're always talking about AJ because he's been really, it's good stuff. He puts out some good stuff. All right, that's all I got for you right now. Oh, please, 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 please. Earlier today, I'm sorry. You guys, I, I don't know whether I used the wrong headline or the wrong thumbnail or what I did wrong, but the video for Brian White earlier today got nowhere, nothing, zip zero. I mean, horrible. I've never seen such terrible numbers. And it was actually a good video. Um, and I highly recommend you go take a look at it. So I'll put the card right here. Just don't know what to, sometimes you just don't know what you did. Um, and uh, then uh, possibly going down and hitting Patreon, that'd be lovely as well. And it has been great, as always, talking to all of you.